In order to help demonstrate how easy Knowledge Studio is to use and how powerful the results can be, let's use the next 10 minutes to analyze the 2019 credit card for our data set from Kaggle. For the sake of time, I've already imported our CSV here into Knowledge Studio and used the variable selection operator to pick the top 15 variables based off of importance rather than the full 86 columns I had in the example set. I also used the partition operator to split the data into a training set and a validation set, just on a 70-30 split and random sampling. Now that we have our training data set built, we can go and build our first model. Knowledge Studio does a great job of providing the user all sorts of data profiling, manipulation, modeling, and evaluation processes without having to know any code. Um, we'll start today with the decision tree and we'll have to first pick our dependent variable. In this case, it'll be fraudulent transaction column, which is a one for fraud and a zero for not fraud cases. And that's because as that's our target variable for the model, we'll leave our training parameters at the defaults. But if you wanted to change it, you do have access to all sorts of different criteria. And we'll leave the automatically grow tree box unchecked in this case, so we can explore the data set visually together. However, in actual use cases, this is a really powerful option that I recommend using to automatically open up the tree. Knowledge Studio's decision tree visual interface here is not only really powerful, but I think really easy to understand and to you know, edit and reason. So here we have the zero again being the not fraudulent, one being fraudulent. We have the absolute record counts, but then also percentages. And these percentages dictate the color of the box here. So we'll right click first and select fly and split. This is going to use those information statistics to basically prioritize the most to least important factors to split on next. However, if you want, and you like as a domain expert, you'll probably know more about the data set than the computer, at least hopefully. You can select next split, for example, to go to the second most, and so on. You also have these buttons up here to do the same thing. Uh, you can also hit the go to split and kind of pick it here at more of like a you know a tab type view of the data. But it's really cool the way it prioritizes it. I also like the way that you can edit it. Like so in this case, for example, zero to one with that being open ended means this is basically when they have one card, sometimes zero is when they have a whole bunch of cards. And then maybe this distinction between two to six, you know, does or doesn't matter. But let's say we know better and we say that it doesn't matter, we can group these two together and simplify the tree. We can then also go to the next step of, you know, finding the next level splits. Like, you know, I, I don't pretend to know what some of these devices are, but uh, but currently, you know, they have a big difference there on the, the likelihood of fraud. Similarly, we can do it here and so on, right? Let's even break this one out further. Try to, you can force a split as well if you want to pick a specific variable to pick on rather than even just trusting the, you know, the model itself. But uh, it's kind of, you know, kind of interesting the way it breaks it apart. Let's go here rather than kind of going step by step. Uh, as much fun as that is, you can also use this automatic grow feature to expand out certain levels uh, as high up or as far down as you want to go. So let's maybe expand, this one's has much less fraud cases. So let's, kind of blow this one up more automatically, right? And unfortunately, there's not much jumping out here other than maybe some things over here with uh, you know, questionable recipient domains. Uh, but the cool thing is you could start to group these things together without, again, having to do the deep dive yourself with all that knowledge. So let's go back to the workflow. We'll save it and go back to our decision tree. Let's, you know, uh, we, maybe we're happy with that model. So we'll right click on our tree to save a model instance. It's kind of like a snapshot in time of that model as we built it. And let's, you know, use that to build a model validation. So we'll drag over. So we'll do the model validation. And obviously we'll need a validation data set in order to validate the model. We shouldn't have to change anything here, but it would let us, you know, remap column names, for example, if it changed between the training and validation set. So we'll run it. Um, drag it over here just to make it easier to see and then uh, open this up here we'll have our confusion matrix is what a lot of people um, you know are first looking at and the performance here isn't great for the fraud cases but you know we can we can improve uh, we also have a lot of measures for the performance of our model like precision and recall and some other you know detailed statistics down here if you want them let's go back another thing people typically want to see is you know more visual way of looking at the model so let's go to the model analyzer We'll select the you know predicted value of interest is one, and to match, we'll also pick the probability one. Let's run it. We'll open it up. 
And you have a lot of your, you know, kind of classical statistical ways of analyzing the model performance too, but again, it's an individual way, right? So cumulative chart, chaos chart, rock chart, these tend to be the two most popular, but you have a lot more here um, if you need them for your use case. Let's close this and kind of jump to the next section where we'll use a strategy tree to dig in further to the model and improve it further. Strategy trees in Knowledge Studio are really awesome. Similar to the way we built that interactive model earlier with the decision tree, we can do something similar with the strategy tree. The difference is that we can kind of even further customize the segments and then the decision points about what to do with the different classifications. And it kind of has a more business process type of feel than, for example, even the decision tree. For the sake of not cluttering up the screen too much, let's take this training data set and we'll link it to another workflow. We can call this one strategy tree. Right. And it's going to create a new one here. We didn't lose our original workflow. We can call this one. Let's rename this to decision tree. Right. And similarly, we can move the validation one over as well. Cool. And now we have two data sets. Now let's zoom in a little, make it easier to see. And we're going to start with the weight of evidence operator to kind of kick off our strategy tree. So you're going to manipulate and then whoa, weight of evidence. Pick the target. Uh, the colors are fine. It's going to be a lot like our decision tree interface, except it's going to be sideways. And now also you have this monitor over here showing the weight of evidence in black. And that line is going to kind of represent, again, that uh, kind of transformation of the bins into these numeric values and show you too that whether it's monotonically increasing, meaning that it's kind of going in one direction consistently, or if you kind of have this up and down. Now, in some use cases, actually, in most use cases, it may not matter um, if you get this up and down behavior. I've seen plenty with bell shapes and things like that. But there are some uses cases where it's really nice to be able to um, guarantee this going in one direction. So let's optimize that monotonic functionality. We'll now put in the force size equal to two. And you can see now it's going to actually update the bins so that you get that nice consistent behavior. It's going to behave a lot more linearly now. You can also, though, interface with it just like we did before and manually override these settings. Let's still group together this range. It's kind of arbitrary. Right. And then this seems like a really big range. So let's break this one apart. I, Let's do 20, and I don't even 2 to 6 seems narrow. Let's, I don't know, update this to 10, right? We can add OK. Oh, cool. And now you can see kind of that other case where I mentioned where now you're not monotonically increasing, but you still do have like maybe a legitimate hump here where for some reason versus the card purchaser account that there's a sweet spot here or an unsweet spot thing. I look at it where the fraudulent activity occurs, maybe not the really high card count, but for some reason here at this cluster. All right, we can go next. Next. And you can see now it's just going to kind of create really these, uh, the bins. Now that we have our weight of evidence, we can go and build a logistic regression on the data. So let's do that. We again pick the fraud, ooh, fraud use case, target category one. I like, there's a lot of different options here on the variable selection methods. Stepwise seems to work pretty well for me and the defaults are always really good. So let's pull these all over and we can hit next. Um, that's fine. It's just giving me a warning about cardinality, but for the demo, that'll be fine. And we're going to run it. Now that we have our logistic regression, we can go and build our scorecard. It's going to kind of help um, make it more digestible for end users, right? So in this case, we have 600 as our starting point, which would be the case where there's like no likelihood of fraud at all. And then as it's more likely to be fraud based off the logistic regression, the points are going to go down, right? And you could switch that around depending on these options here. We'll select run. It's okay. Cool, let's score it like we did earlier against our validation data set. So we'll carry that over, double click to set it up. We don't have to do anything special here. So now we can build our actual strategy tree. It's gonna look and feel kind of a lot like a decision tree uh, with the advantage of being able to add a kind of custom cost function here too. So we'll do that, we'll add cost. I copy and paste this expression from earlier, but it's basically gonna take our fraudulent transaction with a zero or one, but multiply it by the amount. So that not only can we get a feel for whether it was fraudulent or not, but kind of estimate the value of that impact as well. Let's double click into the strategy tree. It's gonna look a lot and feel a lot like the decision tree earlier, except it's gonna go left to right instead of top down. And we have the cost now of that fraud as well. So we'll first start by just clicking on the fine split. So if we double click into this, it'll look and feel a lot like our decision tree interface we had earlier, except go left to right instead of uh, bottom down. And then with the addition of this cost here as well, the actual fraud. So we'll start by doing a fine split for the fraudulent transaction, similar to like we did before. And except now you'll see that from top to bottom, we have you know most likely to be fraud to least likely to be fraud. 
and it kind of corresponds with those low points as it goes to high points. Uh, but let's start by editing this so that we can kind of, you know, simplify it a little bit, just like we were doing in our previous examples. Group that together, press OK. And then we can add our treatment groups. So you can right click on any of these nodes, select treatments. I already had these set up for this, but you can name these whatever you want. I'll call this one reject. Let's make this one investigate. And the best case scenario, we'll call this approve. All right, and so now you can have a nice visual way of looking at it and kind of distributing this to other people without them having to maybe necessarily understand all the math going on in their hood. And it's a really easy way to digest the model, especially as it gets more complex in real life.